Hello, and welcome to Clean Tech Change Agents, where we work together in the fight against global climate change by learning and by advocating at the grassroots level. My name is Benjamin, and today we're going to be talking about one of the primary mechanisms that governments use to encourage adoption of renewables. If you'd like to support our channel, you can sign up on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash ctca, and I'll leave a link for you in the description. So when you think about the regulatory mechanisms that governments use to encourage renewables, what comes to mind? Cap and trade? Classifying CO2 as a pollutant, in other words, emission standards? A carbon tax? Well, you're correct about all of these, but an overarching mechanism that you see all over the place right now is the Renewable Portfolio Standard, or RPS. And as you go out into your community as a change agent, this is one of the things that you'll often be advocating for. So it's important to understand it, at least at a high level. So what is a Renewable Portfolio Standard? Well, this is sometimes called a Renewable Energy Standard, or RES. And it's basically a government mandate that says, okay, local utility, you have to source a certain percentage of your electricity from clean sources, from renewable sources. Uh, there's a different uh, standard, a clean energy standard, which can include things like nuclear or um, coal and natural gas combined with carbon capture. So something slightly different. Um, and uh, what you'll do is uh, for an RPS will set a, an end date and an end goal. So let's take, for example, 100% renewables by 2050. And then the percentage that must come from renewable, renewables will, will increase over time. Uh, and this varies depending on the jurisdiction. So uh, the target, uh, the uh, compliance or the enforcement mechanisms, whether it's voluntary um, or mandatory, that will change from place to place. Uh, and I plan to do a deep dive on one example of an RPS. Virginia recently passed their Clean Economy Act, um, which includes an RPS target 100% by 2045 or 2050, uh, depending on the utility in the state. Uh, and so I'm going to do a deep dive. Um, but uh, this, is, this is RPS at a high level. Now, there's, there's no national RPS in the United States, but over half of states do have something in place. And this got me wondering, what would be the effect of a national RPS or if most states adopted aggressive RPS goals? If we're advocating for the widespread use of these mechanisms, which many of us are, we ought to understand the results that that would lead to. For this, I'm going off of a 2016 study by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. They looked at the anticipated results of widespread adoption of RPSs across the U.S. versus what would happen if we abandoned the ones that we already had. And they also looked at the current guide, plat guide path, if we just stayed with what we have, but we don't adopt any new ones. And the difference between the high adoption model versus the abandonment model, those are stark. By 2050, in the high RPS scenario, you're generating 49% of your electricity via renewables, versus only 35% in the no RPS scenario. Uh, and electricity probably gets more expensive. Uh, consumers could be spending uh, four and a half cents, five cents more per kilowatt hour, and utilities would have to invest up to 200 billion in extra grid improvements to handle all of those distributed energy resources coming online. Um, now that is the high-end scenario, and depending on the year and the region, and especially the pace of advancement of renewable renewable technologies. Uh, you know, we've already seen the cost of solar come down so fast, so quickly. Storage is coming down. Solar plus storage is very competitive. So depending on all of these variables, um, electricity prices could actually stay the same. So that's the bad news. Possibly more expensive electricity for consumers and more investment needed for utilities. Uh, but the good news is the switch to clean energy reduces chemicals and particles in the air that get people sick. Nitrous oxides are reduced by nearly 30%. And these are the molecules that combine with volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and UV rays to form ground level ozone, which aggravates emphysema, bronchitis, and asthma, and can cause wheezing, chest pain, dry throat, headache, and nausea. And that sounds like the side effects of some horrible medication. Uh, but it's bad stuff. 
Sulfur dioxide is also reduced by nearly 30% by adopting widespread RPSs. And this is the molecule that when combined with water and air forms acid rain. And in gaseous form, it irritates the respiratory tract and aggravates conditions such as asthma and chronic bronchitis. Stop for a second and think about what this means for people, for families, for their kids. It's easier to get people on board if you can make the effects real for them. So it's not a drought in a far off country. That's not the, that, that is an effect of climate change, right? But to get people more motivated, you have to tie it back to their personal experience and what it means for their health and their family's health and for their wallets, right? So the reduction in the chemicals that I mentioned earlier, as well as fine particulate matter in the air that gets people sick, that will lead to almost $600 billion in savings through 2050, which offsets the increase in electricity prices to consumers that I mentioned earlier. Additionally, you're reducing CO2 production by 23% through 2050 by adopting these RPSs, which saves you another $600 billion. Uh, now, I'm not exactly sure how the researchers arrived at, at that cost uh, or the, the benefit of CO2 production. It sounds like there's a way to price the cost of climate change or a ton of carbon that has some scientific consensus because they really didn't dig into the way that they got that number. Um, and I think that will be the subject of a future video. So let me know in the comments if that's interesting to you. Lastly, the study doesn't quantify the dollar benefit of water savings, but it does mention that each megawatt hour that goes from fossil fuel to renewables saves 290 gallons of water. Now this made me really happy to hear uh, because our family recently switched to a 100% renewable energy plan. It says it was sourced from, it's sourced from Texas wind and we use about a megawatt hour uh, of electricity on your average month. So it's, it's good to know that we're also conserving water with that choice. Uh, and to be honest, if it's, if it's something you wanna look at, it really wasn't much more expensive at all. Uh, and it was really easy to switch. Um, and uh, from, from what I understand, uh, making that switch uh, reduces your family's carbon footprint by about a third. Um, and it's more or less depending on if you have uh, natural gas um, water heating, for instance, versus electric water heating, you know, but uh, it, it really makes a difference. So it's something to check out. Speaking of natural gas, one final benefit of the use of all of these renewables for electricity generation is this will reduce the demand for natural gas. And natural gas is also used in heating and cooking, so the price will go down for those things, and that'll end up saving consumers another $100 billion. What does the study say about job creation, which is a major selling point for proponents of some of the more sweeping green energy reform efforts? Now, of course, this study doesn't speak to programs like the Green New Deal. It just talks about RPSs. But basically, adoption of widespread RPSs, according to these researchers, will create millions of jobs. But the researchers think the jobs will leave industries related to fossil fuel production and refining, transportation and supporting jobs, etc., such that the net effect will be the same number of jobs. Now, it's possible the new jobs will be safer, more secure, better paying, all of that. But the study doesn't speak to that. And that's something that I like to research more in the future. What is clear is there's going to be a transition and, and folks will be displaced. Some will need to retrain. Some will probably have to relocate. And as a change agent, you need to understand all of the stakeholders and how these policies affect people's lives. Because if you don't, how are you going to relate to people and bring them over to our side and make real change happen? All right. Thanks for hanging with me. Uh, quick note, some of the clips you saw in today's video were provided by Vidizi. I hope you learned a lot about renewable portfolio standards. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing by clicking on the big green circle over to my right. And I'll see you next time on Clean Tech Change Agents.